Chapter 5. Wilds. A John Mond established a monastic routine at Deng Forest Monastery that laid out a monk's daily duties and responsibilities beginning from the moment he rose in the early morning until he retired late at night, and his disciples conscientiously followed that schedule. Rising in the early hours before dawn, the monks got up quickly, washed their faces in cold water to liven up, then stepped onto their meditation paths to pace back and forth until all drowsiness had been dispelled. As dawn broke, each monk descended from his hut carrying his bowl and robes and hastened to the dining hall. The gathered monks began their chores by scrubbing and sweeping the hardwood floor and railings, after which they placed their sitting cloths on the clean floor, rinsed out their alms bowls with cold water, and set the bowls at their seats in preparation for the day's alms round. In the time remaining before the walk to the village, they swept the grounds around the dining hall in all directions. When the early morning light was bright enough to leave for alms round, each monk re-entered the hall, put on his upper and outer robes, slung his alms bowl over one shoulder, and started walking with the others toward the village to collect alms. Upon returning to the monastery, he hung his outer robe in the sun, put on his upper robe, and attended to the food he'd received in his bowl. Once all the monks were seated, Ajahn Mon led them in chanting the blessing, rejoicing in the generosity of the givers and wishing peace and happiness to all living beings. Before beginning the meal, each monk focused on the food he was preparing to eat, reflecting on its nature and its purpose as follows. The food I am about to consume is eaten simply for the purpose of maintaining the body's health and longevity and relieving its various afflictions. Eating this meal as a support for living the holy life, I will conduct myself blamelessly and live a simple life. After finishing his meal, each monk carried his empty bowl to the washing area outside, scrubbed it clean, dried it in the sun, put it in a carrying case, and returned it to his hut, where he placed it neatly in one corner. The bowl's lid was left slightly open to allow any residual food odors to escape. The monk took time to pick and brush his teeth and attend to his toilet needs. After that, he might take a short rest, but would not fall asleep. When he felt refreshed, he rose to pay respects to the small Buddha statue in his hut, and sat down to begin meditating on his preferred meditation theme. If he continued to feel drowsy, he would step outside his hut and onto his walking meditation path to focus his attention on the body in motion. Invigorated by walking, he later returned to a seated posture, the right foot placed on the left thigh, the left foot placed on the ground, and tucked under the right thigh. Firmly grounded in body and mind, a monk could pass many hours absorbed in mindful awareness. Every day at 4 p.m., the resident monks put aside their formal meditation practice to participate in the afternoon chores required of all members of the community. They began by sweeping the grounds of the entire monastery compound. Having closed their bowl's lids tightly to keep out the dust, they swept leaves and twigs from the area around their huts and continued sweeping the path that led from their huts to the main hall. They finished by sweeping the wide, cleared area encircling the open-air hall. Several monks began cleaning dust from the hall's floor while others proceeded to the well to fetch water to fill the earthenware pots that held water used for drinking and washing. When their chores were completed, the monks donned their bathing cloths and took a bath at the well. Feeling clean and refreshed from a cold water bath, each monk returned to his hut and stepped onto his meditation path. Standing erect and alert with hands joined just below the waist, the palm of the right hand gently overlapping and clasping the back of the left, he paced the path from one end to the other and back again until sunset. As night fell, the monks often congregated at Ajahn Mun's hut to give him a massage and listen while he gave an inspiring Dhamma teaching on the merits of training the mind with the powers of mindfulness and wisdom. Afterward, he asked the monks to return to their huts to chant and meditate on their own. Typically, monks at Deng Forest Monastery went to sleep at around 10 p.m. and woke up at 3 a.m., 
getting up quickly, washing their faces with cold water, and stepping onto their meditation paths, just as they had the morning before. This was the basic daily routine that Ajahn Mand employed to keep his disciples fully focused on their monastic purpose throughout their waking hours. Ajahn Mand always followed well-established monastic practices that had been passed down and used effectively through successive generations from the time of the Buddha to the present day. He believed that following those procedures diligently, with attention to detail, guarded against complacency and misbehavior in the monastic community. He stressed that proper conduct, especially regarding the monastic rules, was the foundation on which a good meditation practice rested. The development of meditative concentration and wisdom required adherence to certain uniform principles of thought, speech, and action. To be successful, this discipline needed to encompass all facets of a monk's character and all aspects of his daily life. Ajahn Mond to say that when the foundation is solid from the beginning, the results will be good in the end. He compared monks who had built such a foundation to rice farmers, who, having prepared their fields well, can expect to harvest a good crop. He constantly reminded his disciples to pay heed to the fine details of their everyday conduct, both those aspects that focused on the monastic code of conduct and those that concerned proper monastic etiquette. Forest monks could not choose to be concerned with some aspects of their behavior and neglect others. Otherwise, their efforts in meditation would ultimately prove disappointing. Ajahn Mand insisted that forest monks pay close attention to these basic elements of the practice. I seemed to be standing in Ajahn Mand's line of fire the whole time I lived with him. He took aim at me even when his intended target was someone else. There were many instances when I was minding my own business and remaining aloof from events happening around me, yet Ajahn Mond singled me out for public criticism. I was caught off guard because I couldn't understand what I'd done wrong. He could be so vocal and so severe with his reprimands that I was occasionally reduced to tears. Assuming that Ajahn Mond had his own good reasons, I silently endured the tongue lashings, remained patient, and carried on. One such episode involved a group of visiting monks who showed up at the monastery to seek Ajahn Mond's advice. Though he was obviously displeased with their comportment, he decided not to confront them directly. Instead, he confronted me. Turning to me sitting quietly nearby, he reprimanded me harshly for some apparent fault. I was devastated. I felt like I was his spittoon. But I sat there calmly, not daring to react. Another incident occurred after I'd finished sweeping leaves from the path going to the communal outhouse. I'd done a thorough job and was pleased with myself. I had painstakingly swept the whole area clean, except for a deep depression around the drainage ditch. Try as I might, I couldn't manage to remove all the leaves from that depression. As I stood there, admiring my handiwork, Ajahn Mon walked into the area inspecting the paths as he went along. He scanned the whole place looking for stray leaves, but I was confident he wouldn't find anything to criticize. Suddenly, he looked up, walked over to where I stood, and started giving me hell. I thought, Oh no, I'm about to bear the blame again. I could see it coming because at that time a group of new monks had come to stay with us, and they liked to talk together throughout the night. A John Mon walked up, and looking right at me, asked in a booming voice, Gia, what are you doing? Who took all the candles from the outhouse? And which one of you swept the ditch over there? Which one? Who just swept there? A John Mon already knew that the new monks were to blame for taking all the outhouse's candles to illuminate their huts while they sat and talked till almost daybreak. They didn't meditate. They were only interested in idle chatter. It so happened that those careless monks were sweeping within earshot of Ajahn Mund. Realizing that scolding them to their faces would be counterproductive, he turned on me instead and bellowed out his disapproval for their benefit. Nonetheless, I still managed to shoot myself in the foot. 
In answer to his question about who had swept the leaves, I proudly informed him that I had swept the whole area. His voice descended like a hammer blow, which startled me because I was unprepared. You've gone over the heads of Ajahn Gong Ma and Ajahn Li to reach me. Now you must make good use of this opportunity. If you insist on misbehaving, I'm telling you, don't stay here. Get out. Go right now and don't come back if this is the way you want to behave. Get out. Leave. Now. The intensity of his rebuke shook me to the core, and inwardly I bowed to his authority. Meanwhile, the new monks had heard what a John Mond said, loud and clear, and they were rattled. They looked at each other in panic and quickly hurried off in separate directions. But they failed to take his words to heart and see the reprimand as a warning directed at them. Instead, they were amused that Tanjia had received a scolding and soon began criticizing me for my perceived shortcomings. In the end, none of those monks were the wiser for Ajahn Mond's teaching. Stubborn and heedless, they neglected to see their own faults, but instead saw faults only in others. Ajahn Mond's indirect approach was characteristic of his teaching style. If he couldn't get through to the recalcitrant monks among us, he made sure that the rest of us got the message loud and clear. He refused to allow us any leeway when it came to inappropriate or undignified behavior. It was unfortunate that certain monks came with the intention to learn Dhamma from Ajahn Mond only to turn a deaf ear to his teachings. Given their attitude, I was baffled as to what kind of lessons they expected to learn from him. In the end, although they were the ones acting like a bunch of swine, it was usually my head that ended up on the chopping block. The fact that Ajahn Mond often treated me like a punching bag was unsettling and disheartening to the point where I sometimes began to question his motives. But in my heart, I accepted that he had valid reasons for his teaching methods, and I deferred to his wisdom. Ultimately, I loved Ajahn Mond like a father. I had lived with Ajahn Mond at Deng Forest Monastery for several months when he received a letter inviting him to join a group of distinguished senior monks at Chedi Luang Monastery in Chiang Mai for a special ceremony honoring the occasion of Maka Puja. This annual ceremony celebrates a gathering held between the Buddha and 1,250 of his Arahant disciples at which the Buddha summarized the basic principles of his teachings as doing good actions, refraining from bad actions, and purifying the mind. By coincidence, the letter arrived when a John Mond was suffering from a bout of malaria. The high fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, and fatigue that he experienced meant that he was not well enough to travel such a long distance. Consequently, and to my surprise, Ajahn Mon asked me to attend the ceremony on his behalf. He wrote a letter to the abbot introducing me as his representative and told me to deliver it to the abbot in person. I did what he asked and felt honored to do so. I left Deng Forest Monastery with tears in my eyes. I worried about Ajahn Mon's worsening condition the whole time I was away. I felt that my fellow monks at the monastery lacked the necessary experience to take care of him in a manner that suited his temperament and took account of his needs. Up to that point I had served as Ajahn Mond's personal attendant, performing the daily chores at his residence, preparing and washing his bowl and robes, arranging the tooth sticks, washing the spittoon and replenishing the drinking water, sweeping and cleaning his residence, giving him a nightly massage, and ministering to him in times of illness. I prepared the water for Ajahn Mond's evening bath, making sure it was the right temperature. I massaged his arms and legs to relieve the stress of aches and pains. I boiled water for his afternoon tea and cleaned the cup when he finished drinking. I washed his robes in a timely manner and laundered his other cloth requisites until they were clean. All those chores were accomplished with mindfulness and wisdom to the best of my ability giving all my energy to those tasks, as if my life depended on his well-being, I never tired of serving my teacher. Everything had to be ready on time and done just the way he preferred it. Out of deep devotion, I gladly took the responsibility of caring for his every need. Not even my own parents had been treated so well. 
My attitude was strange, really, because it was out of character for me to devote so much time and energy to the needs of another person. By nature, I instinctively preferred to focus my time and energy on my own practice. How could I suddenly be so neat and tidy with someone else's requisites when my own hut always looked messy and unkept? Although I felt indifferent to my own living conditions, I would not tolerate the slightest neglect of the high standards that Ajahn Mon demanded of me. No matter how much stress and strain that attention to detail entailed, I always rushed back to be close by his side. I felt that a special kinship existed between the two of us. Perhaps I had a past life connection with Ajahn Mon. Perhaps our karmic paths had crossed long ago in lives of Buddhist endeavor. Even though I tended to appear disheveled and socially awkward, he never gave up on me. In fact, he was always kind to me, no matter how it may have appeared to others. I'm not ashamed to admit that whenever I recall the kindness he showed me when I lived with him, I'm left so speechless with emotion that sometimes I shed tears of gratitude. The more I reflect deeply on Ajahn Mond's exemplary conduct and the tireless energy he put into instructing his students, the more certain I am that no one else in the world had such a storehouse of merit and virtue. He never sought mundane happiness for himself. On the contrary, he endured the hardships of forest life just so he could help relieve the suffering of his disciples. The time I spent as Ajahn Mond's student was the most auspicious period of my life. To me, he was the embodiment of the Buddha's teachings on Dhamma and Vinaya. As a fully awakened Arahant, he was revered by humans and celestial beings from all realms of existence. As soon as the Makapuja ceremony at Chedi Luang Monastery concluded, I hurried back from Chiang Mai to help look after my teacher, whose malarial symptoms had worsened in the interim. He continued to suffer bouts of high fever, followed by cold sweats and chills. He hadn't eaten any food the whole time I was gone. Ajahn Mond had been struggling with malarial symptoms off and on for years. He further aggravated those symptoms while on a visit to a hill tribe village where he had been invited to preside over a local merit-making function. Feeling unwell even before he left, he made the long trip through the mountains on foot as a favor to a longtime supporter who was hosting the event. The strain of the journey worsened his condition, causing a sharp spike in his fever. Malarial parasites had begun to infect his brain, which made him feel nauseous and disoriented. Despite this severe disability, Ajahn Mond made the trek back to Deng Forest Monastery on foot as soon as the merit-making function ended. That long march was a trip to remember for the young hill tribesmen who accompanied him. He was amazed by the speed with which Ajahn Mond covered the distance over mountains and through valleys despite his ailing health. He exclaimed to us when they arrived that, even though he'd hiked in those mountains all his life, he couldn't keep up with the old and sickly monk he was escorting. The way Ajahn Mond glided effortlessly along the forest paths without tiring left the young man gasping for air as he tried to keep up with him. The whole experience made him wonder what the trip would have been like had Ajahn Mond been in good health. In any event, Ajahn Mond arrived back long before his young escort. Back at the monastery, Ajahn Mond's condition continued to deteriorate. Fearing the worst, Nan Deng, a devout supporter from Chiang Mai, entreated Ajahn Mond to travel to McCormick Hospital in Chiang Mai for treatment, and he agreed. In those days, there were no roads linking the monastery to the city, so we were obliged to travel there on foot. We soon set off together. Ajahn Man walked ahead at his usual rapid pace, his walking stick tapping out the rhythm of his steps. I followed behind, carrying two alms bowls slung across my shoulders, trying desperately to keep up. His capacity for tolerating acute pain and discomfort was second to none. Finally arriving at Chiang Mai City, we stopped briefly to rest at Chedi Luang Monastery before proceeding to the hospital. Nan Dang and other local supporters took care of all the arrangements for Ajahn Mond's admission to McCormick Hospital, which had been founded by a group of Christian missionaries. Catering mostly to wealthy patients, it offered the most advanced care in the city at that time.
The abbot of Chedi Luang Monastery arranged for a specialist to supervise Ajahn Mond's medical care. After administering several standard remedies for cerebral malaria, which showed only negligible results, the doctor was unwilling to give an assurance about Ajahn Mond's recovery. He whispered to the abbot that he'd reached the limit of what he could do to help. The condition was life-threatening. He was concerned that as the hours passed, Ajahn Mond might slip into a coma. As soon as the doctor left the room, Ajahn Mond called the abbot to his bedside and asked what the doctor had said. When told, he assured the abbot that he would not die from this illness, so everyone should remain calm and not panic. Calling all of us together, he explained what he intended to do next. He had investigated his condition thoroughly and concluded that only the therapeutic powers of Dhamma could effect a cure for the illness. He then specified a secluded location not far from Chiang Mai, known as Pur Forest, where he asked to be taken. The abbot immediately arranged to send him to Pur Forest. Before Ajahn Mond left the hospital to head for Pur Forest, I took his leave, hiked back to Deng Forest Monastery, and reported his decision to the interim abbot Ajahn Prom Chirapunyo. That same night, Ajahn Prom called a meeting of the monastic community and inquired as to who among the monks present would volunteer to look after Ajahn Mond's needs at Pur Forest. Without hesitation, I raised my hand. Ajahn Prom kept looking around the room, but no one else made a gesture. They all sat quietly with heads bowed. The other monks didn't dare to speak up. They were too afraid of Ajahn Mond, who had a reputation for fierceness and harsh admonishments. I looked at the monk sitting beside me, Tan Ta Piak, whom I had known from the time we lived together at Saingam Forest Monastery in Chantaburi. I leaned over and spoke softly, encouraging him to join me. Would he go with me to take care of a John Mon? Tan Ta Piak nodded, and having received a John Prom's consent, we agreed to leave the next morning. We started the trek back to Chiang Mai after the morning meal and didn't arrive until nine at night, almost twelve hours on our feet. By contrast, when Ajahn Mon and I walked to Chiang Mai, we left at the same time after the meal, but arrived in Chiang Mai at five in the afternoon. That's four hours faster. And Ajahn Mon was sick with malaria. The problem was that Tan Ta Piak, though young, walked the forest trails very slowly, resting often. We spent that night at Chedi Luang Monastery in Chiang Mai. The following morning, Nan Dying arrived with a car, picked us up, and drove us to Pur Forest, where we respectfully greeted Ajahn Mond and bowed at his feet. His thin, gaunt appearance worried us. Clearly the malaria still raged inside his body. He'd lost more weight, and his strength appeared to be waning, as though life energy was draining from his haggard form. Simply walking required one person on either side to prop him up and prevent him from falling over. But remarkably, his radiant inner presence showed no signs of sickness or infirmity. He uttered not a single complaint about his worsening condition. He didn't groan or bemoan his fate. His indomitable character made a John Mond an easy patient to nurse. Even the doctors were impressed by his unflappable equanimity in the face of intense suffering. He projected such a feeling of warmth and tranquility that everyone around him felt soothed and reassured. In times of illness, Ajahn Mond preferred to employ the therapeutic powers of Dhamma to manage the pain and bring about an effective cure. This method entailed investigating painful bodily feelings with an intense, incisive degree of mindfulness and wisdom. He viewed all pain as a manifestation of the noble truth of suffering. The weakness and exhaustion he displayed externally resembled that of any other sick person. But internally, Mindfulness and wisdom rose in his heart like warriors preparing to do battle, ensuring that no amount of pain affected his presence of mind. If the Dhamma troops succeeded, the symptoms would abate and health would be restored. If, however, Ajahn Mond were to die on the battlefield, he would die undefeated. He praised monks who remained self-controlled during onslaughts of painful feelings, 
calling them worthy representatives of the warrior spirit that's expected of Dutanga monks. In critical situations, they stood their ground and put up a strong fight. No matter how overwhelming the pain, a Dutanga monk's mindfulness and wisdom never retreated or conceded defeat. Even in death, he was triumphant. Ajahn Mon used inspirational teaching methods to boost his disciples' fighting spirit, regardless of whether they were sick or healthy. He insisted that his monks act like warriors fighting to rescue themselves from mortal danger. He placed special emphasis on remaining steadfast in times of illness, with the intention of preventing meditators from becoming dispirited when pain threatened to overwhelm their defenses. Ajahn Mon tended to rebuke sick monks who showed signs of weakness or despair, believing that putting up with difficult situations while investigating them carefully was the least a practicing monk could do to live up to his status as a son of the Buddha. Ajahn Mon had adopted this uncompromising attitude toward ill health when he first ordained. His initial reaction to sickness of any kind was to focus the powers of Dhamma he'd developed in Samadhi and insight meditation on bodily symptoms as they occurred. He would focus those therapeutic powers on the feelings of pain and weakness that arose in order to neutralize their debilitating effects and gradually bring about a long-term cure. He rarely turned to doctors and medical remedies for relief. On the occasions when he experienced a dangerous health crisis, an internal investigation of the disease in his body and symptoms such as fever or fatigue was critical to his survival and recovery. With some illnesses, especially those he experienced alone deep in the wilderness, Dhamma medicine was his only recourse to treat the problem. At such times, mindfulness and wisdom worked day and night to bring his physical condition back from the brink. Ajahn Mond had struggled with chronic stomach pains since childhood. Every time this condition flared up, the abdominal pains became so severe that he couldn't move without causing more pain. His only source of relief was meditation, using wisdom techniques to keep his mind in the present and work with the effects of the searing pain. His stomach problem became so acute and persistent at times that the condition appeared to be life-threatening. Under those circumstances, an ordinary, untrained person who relied only on doctors and medicines would surely have succumbed to the illness. Likewise, if Ajahn Mon had depended solely on external support, as though he lacked a nose of his own to breathe with, he would surely have died in agony at some remote forest location. Instead, he relied on calling forth the therapeutic power of Dhamma to escape from the clutches of death. He said that as soon as the symptoms of illness started to appear, the therapeutic properties of his meditation responded immediately and began to bring relief. As a result, he showed little interest in conventional medicines. Even as his vitality steadily declined in old age, he continued to apply Dhamma medicine to maintain harmony in his bodily elements. When Ajahn Mon addressed a sick monk, he brought up his own experiences as examples to follow. He would say, When the body is sick with a high fever and relentless pain, immediately summon the therapeutic power of Dhamma and use it to deal with those debilitating conditions. When this method is practiced with persistence, the sickness will abate and its symptoms will subside on their own. When you have courage to fortify yourself and mindfulness and wisdom as your guides, the painful feelings caused by illness can be overcome. This approach fosters a solid basis of Dhamma in the heart that will serve you well, not only in times of sickness, but also in times of good health. Mindfulness and wisdom teach you to understand the connection between body, pain, and mind. When their relationship is clearly understood, painful feelings will never again be a cause for concern. The firm basis in Dhamma achieved through meditation on pain can become so stable that, should a critical situation arise in the future, your well-trained mindfulness and wisdom will come to the rescue, overriding the anxiety caused by pain and allowing you to reach a state of equanimity. When death becomes imminent, you will not feel weak or disheartened, and thus will not be overwhelmed. Having succeeded in mastering the noble truth of suffering, you can boldly face this moment of ultimate truth about life and death.
I was blessed with the chance to nurse Ajahn Mon back to health during his convalescence at Pur Forest. There I saw further evidence that he was an exemplary teacher in every aspect of the practice, both in his impeccable behavior and in his outstanding mental qualities. His energy, endurance, courage, frugality, and sublime detachment were exceptional attributes that put him in a class of his own. None of his disciples could rival Ajahn Mon's excellence in those virtues. He was the ultimate Dhamma warrior, intrepid and fearless to such a degree that mortal enemies like craving and ignorance could never perturb his equanimity. Living with Ajahn Mond motivated me to have great enthusiasm for the principles of Dhamma. Although I endured many hardships practicing under austere conditions, his authentic training methods brought joy to the practice. The affection and devotion I felt for my teacher gave me a feeling of complete confidence in his guidance. I placed my life and well-being solely in his hands. I managed to put up with the daily deprivations because he convinced me that Dhamma was more important than all other matters. I was content to persevere through days of rigorous training because of his steadfast support and guidance. There were times when I felt that I would willingly give up my life for him without regret. Ajahn Mond contended that because the human body is naturally subject to old age, sickness, and death, human beings can expect to experience many kinds of painful afflictions during their lives. He challenged his disciples to realize that pain and suffering need not be the same thing. Even while experiencing a severe sickness, it's possible to convert the resulting pain into a Dhamma lesson by deeply investigating pain's true nature with mindfulness and wisdom. How much we suffer from painful feelings depends more on the degree to which we cling to our bodies than it does on the severity of the affliction the body endures. Suffering is caused not by the severity of the physical condition, but by how attached we are to our physical well-being. If we were not attached to the body, then painful feelings on their own would not cause us to suffer. When we reach a clear understanding that the mind's grasping at and clinging to the body is actually the main problem, then when the body is in pain, the mind need not suffer as a consequence. Painful feelings are seen merely as natural phenomena, arising and ceasing, which need not result in experiences of personal suffering. Ajahn Mon did not deny the effectiveness of medical remedies for healing disease, nor did he forbid his monks to seek such remedies. He explicitly stated that diseases caused by imbalances in the bodily elements, such as infections, allergies, and malnutrition, can be treated and cured by taking medications prescribed for those ailments. What he objected to was meditation monks making a habit of depending on doctors and medical cures to relieve every ailment they suffered. Such an attitude tended to strengthen the defilements and weaken the warrior spirit that would embolden these monks to hold their ground and put up a fight. He wanted his monks to make a habit of fending for themselves, rather than habitually looking outside for help. The warrior training that he emphasized aimed to instill in them a faith in the power of their own inner strength. He worried that without that attitude his monks would become so afraid of dying that they'd neglect to search for the healing power of Dhamma within themselves. Ajahn Mon constantly reminded his disciples that death is the natural consequence of birth. That all creatures born on this earth will eventually die, their bodies decaying until they are reduced to their natural elements. Indeed, everything in the universe is impermanent and ever-changing. Everything will disintegrate and disappear. Because death is unavoidable, fear of this inevitability is misguided. Better they fear rebirth and its consequences, and use that apprehension as motivation to go beyond birth and death entirely. If fear of death prevents a monk from diligently practicing meditation, he is bound to come back and suffer pain and distress time and time again in future births. Likewise, if he doesn't experience for himself what it's like to overcome the fear of intense pain, he'll likely never experience the wonders of Dhamma. 
dying and being born again means continuing to carry the burden of misery with no end in sight. Monks who overcome the fear of death can gradually reduce their number of rebirths until they eventually transcend birth and death altogether. At that point, they will never again return to bear the burden of suffering. While I was nursing a John Mond back to health, Lady Keo, a long-standing supporter, paid him a visit one day and offered to provide him a donation of one Thai bot. That same evening, as I massaged Ajahn Mon's feet, I asked him to please consider whether it would be appropriate to use Lady Keo's donation to purchase a can of condensed milk so that he could drink a cup every morning to regain his strength. Back then, the only milk available was a brand of sweetened condensed milk called Molly, and one can of it cost only five Thai pennies. I sat still listening for his answer, but Ajahn Mon remained silent. He was probably thinking over his options, as every action he took, even in such a small matter as this, demanded conformity with the Dhamma in his heart. He never gave more priority to food or health than to the principles of Dhamma. He used to say, I'm a son of the Buddha practicing the Dhamma, and every aspect of my behavior must conform to a higher standard. Although that standard may displease the sensibilities of worldly people, I cannot violate my oath to faithfully observe the major and minor principles of monastic conduct which the Lord Buddha so compassionately established for the Sangha. The true Dhamma is not influenced by popular trends or majority opinion, but is rather the exclusive right of the pure mind that has fully realized the truth of that Dhamma. Ordinary people whose minds are tainted by the defiling influence of their own self-interest tend to set up standards that benefit them personally. Being a Dhamma practitioner, I must take the Buddha's teachings as the highest authority governing my actions. Taking this attitude is far safer than following the dictates of self-interest or majority opinion. Following a long period of silence, I spoke up again. Drinking a little milk every day can be beneficial for the elderly. It helps rejuvenate the body so it can recover more quickly from illness. Please try drinking a cup of milk in the morning. Ajahn Mon continued to sit quietly as before. I took his silence to mean that he had accepted my proposal. At sunrise the following morning, I had a layman take the money which Lady Keo had offered to the market and buy a can of condensed milk. When he returned, I heated up the milk and offered it to him. Appearing annoyed, he refused to drink it, telling me that milk usually gave him diarrhea. Undeterred, I implored him to try it anyway, assuring him that he needn't worry as I would take care of any mess myself. Hearing that, Ajahn Mon relented. The milk helped him to gradually regain the strength he needed to fight off the malaria. When Lady Keo's money ran out, Nandang continued to provide condensed milk until Ajahn Mond made a full recovery. After that, he stopped taking milk entirely. He had been drinking the milk merely as a medicine, not because he enjoyed the taste or craved the extra vitality. I served Ajahn Mond with a sense of deep faith and awe in the steadfastness with which he comported himself through times of severe hardship. Being in his presence while illness ravaged his body became an important lesson for me in the unsurpassed power of spiritual well-being. Through the dignity and composure he displayed when encountering bodily sickness, he educated a physically healthy person like me about the superiority of inner strength over physical strength. It was a potent reminder that diseases of the spirit are potentially far more damaging than those of the body. Ajahn Mond himself liked to say that it's possible for a human being to remain healthy and free from physical sickness for a year or two, or for decades, or even for their entire life. Finding people with good healthy bodies is not so unusual, but finding people with good healthy spiritual qualities is very unusual. The diseases of greed, aversion, and delusion, and their legion of contagious mental defilements, are like a plague that infects the hearts and minds of people everywhere. 
no one is spared the harmful effects of this widespread contagion. The Buddha and the Arahants are the sole exception. Only the Buddha and the Arahants have cured these chronic ailments for good. Only they have totally eradicated diseases of the mind. For three months, I attended to Ajahn Man's every need, nursing him back to good health as best I could with the limited resources at hand. Of course, my clumsy efforts paled in comparison to my teacher's curative powers. Still, I put my body on the line for him, and his condition steadily improved. Just after dawn every morning, I scrubbed and swept his hut, prepared his robes, and set out his alms bowl for the morning meal. Due to ailing health, he was unable to make the long walk to the village and back, so the rest of us shared with him the best of the food we received in our bowls, and I added a cup of warm, condensed milk each day. After the meal, I washed his bowl, dried it thoroughly in the sun, and returned it to its place in his hut. I then cleaned the outhouse toilet and swept the ground around the hut. In the afternoon, I brought Ajahn Man a cup of hot tea and again swept the leaves from his path. I boiled a kettle of water and mixed the hot water with his cold bath water. Then I used my palms and fingers to rub the warm water over his frail body in a circular motion. One therapy I administered every night without fail was a full-body massage. At dusk, I would walk to his hut, prostrate to his recumbent figure reclining on a thin straw mat, and start to massage his limbs. I was careful not to press too firmly for fear of accidentally injuring him. By then, his body was little more than skin and bones, and it ached constantly. Ajahn Mond found this type of massage helpful for reviving the strength and relieving the discomfort in his weakening body. So I kneaded and squeezed his legs and arms several hours every night for the entire three months he was recuperating from that bout of malaria. In the end, his health returned to normal, and I felt greatly relieved. Although nursing Ajahn Mond through illness put a strain on me physically, my mind was peaceful and happy. The physical difficulty was part of the training, and I accepted it gladly. The exhaustion and hunger I endured never bothered me. I looked on the whole experience as an extremely valuable Dhamma teaching, one in which I became so absorbed that I lost all track of time. I felt no desire to be anywhere else but by his side day and night. His presence was the treasure I'd been seeking all my life. His pure goodness and impeccable demeanor drew me to him like a magnet. The highest truth of the Buddha's teachings is not a right or privilege that can be bought by the rich and famous. That truth can be realized only by one whose heart has been purified in Dhamma. The inner wealth of such an individual surpasses any riches that might be amassed in the human world. Ajahn Mand lived in extreme poverty by worldly standards. He had no possessions of any worth. What he possessed in abundance was a wealth of Dhamma. In spiritual wealth, he was unsurpassed in our day and age. He was a famous monk with lots of disciples, but he rarely had enough food to eat from one day to the next. Living with him was hard because basic requisites were always in short supply. For as long as I stayed with Ajahn Man, I never saw him eat high-quality food. His penchant for living in the wilderness, in caves and under overhanging cliffs, at cremation grounds and other remote places, precluded the luxury of a nutritious diet. He preferred to avoid busy commercial centers like towns and cities because their social activities and prosperous lifestyles were unsuitable for the tasks of calming the mind and transcending the cycle of birth and death. Thajan Man chose a life of deprivation by staying at places where even the simple requisites he used daily were scarce and hard to come by. People living comfortably in their homes would find such conditions unbearable but he embraced this lifestyle voluntarily for the purpose of achieving enlightenment. He lived for Dhamma and accepted the inconvenience and hardship associated with its practice. These harsh conditions also served as a challenging spiritual training ground for the monks who practiced under his guidance. 
monks had to force themselves to live in this way because such living conditions naturally went against the grain. Ajahn Mon spent most of his life in wilderness areas, where villages were located a day's walk apart, places where he could easily put the teaching into practice. When I stayed with him, we often ate only plain rice, with no other food items added. I never once tasted a piece of grilled fish, but Ajahn Mond always gave the impression that wherever we were was just the right place to be because we were prospering in Dhamma. His attitude indicated that the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha were always present, living with him, at one with his supreme awareness. For this reason, he felt contentment whenever and wherever he traveled. Ajahn Mon taught his monks to put body and mind on the line when striving to establish a firm basis in the practice. They must be willing to sacrifice their lives for Dhamma. Everyone who is born must die. Such is the nature of the world. It's fruitless trying to resist that truth. The fruits of Dhamma cannot be experienced by denying the natural order of things. Ajahn Mon expected a practicing monk to be resolute and brave in the face of death. He insisted that his monks live in isolated wilderness areas teeming with wild animals so that they could discover for themselves the liberating power of meditation. Training with him forced us to be prepared for anything, including the prospect of dying, for danger lay in wait at the various places where we practiced. But the lesson was clear. When a monk was constrained by living in a frightening place where the food was limited and the basic requisites were scarce, his mind tended to be constantly under the control of mindfulness. As a result of strong, mindful awareness, he was often able to attain samadhi faster than would otherwise be expected. Ajahn Mond was confident that monks who practiced while hemmed in on all sides by adversity and hardship could experience advancements in their meditation that would exceed all their expectations. One day while I was doing walking meditation on a path under the trees at the edge of Deng Forest Monastery, I heard a woman singing as she walked through the fields behind me. With what was obviously a northeastern accent, she sang a soulful song in such a beautiful voice and with such fervent emotion that the sound pierced my heart. The lyrics she sang in a high-pitched, mournful voice sounded like a lament of her life of pain and suffering. Those words communicated a flavor of the Buddha's teaching, which prompted me to reflect deeply on the sad reality of human existence. Although she sang from her raw emotions without much mindfulness, I turned my listening inward to connect with the Dhamma in my heart. The sound of her voice resonated with my inner awareness, until suddenly, while standing still on the meditation path, I experienced a profound insight that caused my awareness to converge rapidly into a central point of focus, drop to the very base of samadhi, and experience an indescribable feeling of pure knowing. The lyrics the lady sang said it all. Suffering of body and mind consumes my thoughts and feelings. Suffering binds me so tightly, leaving no room for escape. Tolerating the suffering of human life, I live and die with pain and sorrow. Suffering of body and mind consumes my thoughts and feelings. Pain and suffering overwhelm my lonely heart. On merely hearing those words, my mind came together and dropped into a state of pure awareness. That extraordinary experience goes to show that Dhamma resides inside the minds of us all. We need only to concentrate our focus in the right way with the right intention to discover the true meaning of suffering and its causes. By acknowledging this potential and acting on it, we can use the sights and sounds of the world as teaching aids, like transforming a poignant song about life's sorrows into a symphony of Dhamma in the heart. Suffering of body and mind, what does it mean? Once a woman marries, she's always busy. Her body is in constant motion. Her husband demands attention and expects to be served, so she shoulders that burden. She soon bears children who add weight to the burden, each in their own way. There's always work to do and mouths to feed. 
She plows the fields and sows the rice, later harvesting and threshing it, all done in the hot sunshine. She feeds her family the best she can, cooking meager meals of rice and wild vegetables mixed with bits of meat and fermented fish paste. She makes brooms and baskets by hand. She sews pillows and mattresses, stuffing them with cotton wool. She knits woolen clothing for the winters and mends threadbare clothes all year long. She provides care and support for her aging parents and for her in-laws as well. Her interest in spiritual matters loses out to the daily toil. Then, when she has a few hours alone, she releases the pent-up emotion by singing her plaintive song. Hearing the haunting refrain of suffering of body and mind had become an inspiration for wisdom to arise. Letting the sound and its lyrics resonate in my heart, I contemplated their significance for people bound up in perpetual hardship, and I experienced a deep dismay for the plight of all living beings. Because I had achieved a degree of freedom from suffering, I could reflect on those who were still trapped in a world of pain and delusion and experience a sense of heartfelt compassion. By that point, I had practiced the Buddha's teachings up to a stage where I began to understand the mind's deluded nature and its wrongful ways of thinking. As a result, my mind's attachments had begun to loosen their grip. This led to a wonderful sense of happiness and freedom. Only when I clearly understood the causes of my own suffering could I begin to realize how much pain and confusion existed in the hearts of other people. Having shown the light of wisdom on my own ignorance, I could view the suffering of others from a higher level of understanding. I saw clearly the way to go beyond suffering and its causes, while other people failed to see it or were uninterested in its existence. Considering this sad situation, a strong feeling of compassion arose within my heart. At the time of the Buddha, some arahants sang their own poetic verses. As I understand, they tended to intone the Dhamma in the melodic Sarabhanya chanting style. When the venerable Sonakuti Kana, a disciple of the Buddha, attained enlightenment, he offered the Buddha an account of his attainment chanted in verse, reciting the stanzas in a Sarabhanya cadence. After listening, the Buddha praised the pleasantly melodic tone of his chanting. Even today, we Thai people like to recite Dhamma versus the Sarabhanya way. I myself enjoy hearing the Sahasanaya verses intoned this way. Sarabhanya chanting is really a form of singing in which the lyrics follow a rhythmic pattern. Setting Dhamma to music originated with a deva puta named Panchasika who was foremost among heavenly musicians. While seated in front of a cave where the Buddha resided waiting for the Buddha to acknowledge his presence, Panchasika pulled out his lute and started to strum. He sang a joyous song about the affection he felt for his beloved. The lyrics compared his love for her to the love the Bodhisatta felt for Bodhinyana, the wisdom of enlightenment. When Panchasika finished, the Buddha praised him for his ability to harmonize his voice with the strings on his instrument. At the time of the Buddha, a group of monks attained enlightenment while contemplating the words of a cheerful song being sung by a gang of female slaves as they drew water from a well. The sound and rhythm of their voices possessed a mesmerizing quality that drew the listener's attention straight to the internal attributes of the sound itself, without reference to the singers or the external circumstances. Many of the Pali verses chanted today have been popular since the time of the Buddha. They were recited regularly throughout the ages by both lay practitioners and enlightened monks. Chanting the same verses that the ancients did connects us with the timeless quality of the Buddha's teachings. Chanting Pali verses as a daily practice fosters success in meditation by allowing chanters to focus on the rhythmic patterns of the chants while also voicing spiritually uplifting sounds that resonate with the heart in a special way. Chanting cultivates mindfulness, builds concentration, strengthens wisdom, and helps keep the mind grounded in the present.
Throughout the period of my attendance on Ajahn Mun, my meditation continued to progress smoothly under his practical guidance. As my mastery of samadhi meditation increased, I experienced the frequent occurrence of nimitas arising in the mind. Nimitas are internal images arising in meditation that can appear in the form of lights, colors, or shapes, and which look as real as external images seen with the naked eye. Unsure as to whether I should actively engage these visions and try to understand them or simply ignore them, I sought Ajahn Mond's advice. He warned me straight away that if their appearance was merely a distraction, they should be intentionally ignored. But if my purpose was to understand the implication of those experiences, I must question the visions directly, and then wait for the nimitta to reveal its significance. I asked him if the images represented something real, something to be trusted. He replied that, in and of themselves, nimittas should not be considered real or trustworthy, but with caution they can be used by skilled meditators as tools for investigating with wisdom. The visions that appeared when my mind attained a state of calm and concentration were usually related to some form of bodily experience. For instance, on one occasion I sat facing a bottomless abyss opening below me. Suddenly my body tilted and started falling headfirst into the dark, yawning chasm. As I hurtled downward toward certain death, I steeled myself for the final impact and prepared to part from my physical body. Then, following a few moments in free fall, the vision vanished as suddenly as it had appeared. On another occasion, the trunk of my body expanded to such an enormous size, as wide as a gigantic water tank, that it felt like my body would burst, scattering body parts in all directions. After experiencing many similar nimittas, I again expressed my concerns to Ajahn Mun and asked for advice on how to investigate them. He said that although such visions appeared to be in front of my field of vision, which caused me to look out at them, they were in fact created inside my mind, and their visual manifestation was merely an illusion. He instructed me to redirect the focus of my awareness inside, to engage images of the body at their source, then use that sharp inner focus to investigate the images of the body created by the mind. With that said, Ajahn Mon urged me not to chase after nimittas arising in my meditation. Images perceived in meditation were merely mental phenomena that had no inherent power of their own. They were no more special than images seen with open eyes. Although they weren't solid like tangible material objects, they were still seen as separate from the awareness that knew them. He insisted that I determine to reverse the direction of my focus, halting the outward flow of awareness and turning it inward to connect with the source of awareness itself. He cautioned that all nimitta visions are unreal and unreliable. Trusting them can destabilize the meditator's mind, threaten its equilibrium, and endanger its sanity. At the very least, they distract from the primary purpose of the Buddha's teachings— the only safe way to deal with them is to bring the images inside and investigate them there. Equipped with Ajahn Mond's sage instructions, I mentally established right mindfulness on the body and combined that with wisdom techniques to redouble my efforts on body contemplation. After withdrawing from samadhi, feeling calm and concentrated, I first focused attention on an imaginary image of my right thumbnail then on images of my index fingernail, my middle fingernail, my ring fingernail, and finally my pinky fingernail. Returning to the thumb, I examined its structure, identified its joints, and then imagined cutting off the joints one by one up to the palm of the hand. The joints of the index and middle fingers were then chopped off as well, followed by the final two fingers. Once the joints of all five had been amputated on each hand, only the imaginary bloodied stumps of the hands remained. Methodically, I focused my attention across the palm to the wrist, where I lopped off my hands at their junction. I proceeded to the middle of my forearm, chopping through muscle and bone to leave only a stump behind. My elbows came next, each severed at the joint. By the time I dismembered the shoulders, the images of both my arms were separated from the torso. 
My awareness scanned the entire physical frame, slicing up the lower body from the toes to the hips and the torso from the hips to the shoulders until only the head and neck remained intact. In my mind's eye, I pulled the right eyeball from its socket, then the left one. I ripped off the right side of my nose, then the left side, the upper lip, then the lower lip, the right ear, then the left. The removal of both cheeks was followed by the extraction of the upper and lower teeth, leaving only a sunken, skeletal face flecked with bits of flesh and skin. The neck was severed at the jaw, exposing a ragged skull that had cracked open at the brow to reveal the soft tissue of the brain. These parts then joined the other severed body parts in an imagined blood-soaked heap of flesh and bone. I further investigated this mass of physical matter by applying to it the perception of the three fundamental characteristics of all things, Anicca, Dukkha, and Anatta. The Buddha recommended that we clearly comprehend how everything in the body is subject to change, how no experience of the body will ever lead to complete and lasting happiness, and how no inherent, independent self can be found therein. Reflecting thus with mindfulness and clear comprehension can reduce the body's power over the mind and allow the mind's subtle awareness to shine forth with greater concentration and clarity. Increased clarity is accompanied by heightened understanding, while strong concentration empowers wisdom to dig deeply to uproot tenacious mental defilements. The removal of those defilements deepens concentration. Body contemplation at this level presents a difficult challenge for the meditator. Its practice requires a degree of heightened concentration that can remain fully focused on the investigative process without succumbing to distractions. Once this strong concentration is established, the mind follows a series of changing images that methodically track each successive stage of the human body's dismemberment. This contemplation, when practiced consistently, enhances one's concentration, which, in turn, leads naturally to the amazing full-absorption experience of Apana Samadhi. Ajahn Mon compared concentration and wisdom to the two wings of a bird in flight. Both wings must be properly balanced to lift the mind above craving and ignorance and toward liberation from suffering. While the insights gained from these practices foster heightened concentration, like a bird's wings, each is essential for traversing the path to enlightenment. Meditative calm, concentration, and clarity of mind must be present before wisdom practices can penetrate to the root causes of suffering. Only when insight gains clear understanding at this deep level can defilements and delusions of the mind be exposed and removed. Concentrated awareness excavates the roots of the tree of ignorance. Wisdom uproots and eradicates them. Ajahn Mon taught well-established meditation practices that had been passed down from generation to generation since the time of the Buddha. He was an acknowledged master of all facets of the Buddha's teachings and remarkably single-minded in his determination to pursue their practice to attain spiritual perfection. He was also keenly aware that people's temperaments and abilities differed widely and understood that it was unwise to teach only one meditation method when it came to the relationship between concentration and wisdom practices. Due to the varying strengths of people's spiritual faculties, not everyone could benefit from a single teaching method. Because Ajahn Mond knew intuitively what each student needed to hear, he tailored the emphasis of his teachings to fit specific individual needs, giving special prominence to the meditation subjects most appropriate to each meditator. While Ajahn Mond lived in the mountains of Chiang Mai, the hill tribe people felt great joy listening to his Dhamma discourses in the late afternoons. Later at night, he taught Dhamma to devas from various realms of sentient existence, kindly responding to their many inquiries. Devas from the surrounding area had all heard of Ajahn Mond. On some nights, thousands of them gathered on the mountain to hear his teaching. From afar, the locals saw a strange radiance illuminating the mountaintop, 
which steadily grew in intensity until the entire mountain appeared to shine brightly. The villagers were bewildered. Was Ajahn Mond's meditation causing the radiance? Or had he perhaps lit an especially bright lantern that night? On the mornings following such episodes, the villagers would ask Ajahn Mond for an explanation as he walked through the village collecting alms food. Did he have a special lantern that could light up the whole mountain? He would just smile, but never revealed the true cause of the luminescence. Ajahn Mond's fine-tuned powers of extrasensory perception contacted a diverse range of celestial beings whose existence was as much a part of his daily experience as that of the wild animals in the forest and the monks he trained in the monastery. He fully understood the causes of birth in these realms of existence. He explained that the reason a being is reborn into a particular realm is that in a previous life that being had made the kind of comma that predisposed it to rebirth in that realm. As a general rule, the quality of future births depends on the moral quality of one's actions and the levels of concentration and wisdom achieved in one's meditation practice. Thus, someone who makes sufficiently good merit in this lifetime may be worthy of rebirth in a heavenly realm. Additionally, the enduring strength of those meritorious deeds will make it more likely that, in a subsequent human birth, such a person will have the good fortune to meet an accomplished meditation monk. But those who spend their lives striving only for fame and fortune will be in danger of slipping into the lower realms because, regardless of what efforts they made to be successful in life, at the time of death, all their worldly achievements will be lost. The only accomplishments that are not lost at death are actions and their future consequences. The karmic consequences of actions taken in this life will follow on to the next life and beyond. Sowing good seeds reaps pleasing fruit both now and in the future, whereas sowing bad seeds reaps unpleasant fruit now and in the future. With this understanding in mind, many faithful Buddhists spend their lives doing as many good deeds as possible with the aim of amassing a large amount of merit as an investment toward a favorable future rebirth. For instance, devout supporters who share their money, time, and effort to construct meeting halls and monks' cabins for a Buddhist monastery are, in effect, building themselves a heavenly palace, an abode that awaits them in a celestial realm of existence at the time of death. I was fascinated by Ajahn Mond's uncanny ability to communicate with non-human beings from many different realms of existence. Since childhood, I'd heard about devas, nagas, and yakas, and how truly accomplished monks could, in some mysterious way, see and converse with these otherworldly beings. As a young monk, I learned from my teachers about the 31 levels of sentient existence— in the Buddhist worldview, the Sangsaric universe is inhabited not only by physical beings like humans and animals, but also by various classes of non-physical heavenly beings called devas, which exist above the human realm in a hierarchy of increasing refinement, and by classes of lower beings living in the subhuman realms of existence. But I had no idea how to see or communicate with any of these realms. Everyone knew that Ajahn Mond was an expert in matters regarding ghosts, devas, brahmas, yakas, and nagas. Although he rarely talked about the extent of his knowledge, he excelled in the ability to interact directly with all the classes of living beings that populate non-physical realms existing beyond the range of ordinary human perception. He maintained daily contact with beings in the higher and lower celestial realms, spirits of the terrestrial realms, and even inhabitants of the hell realms, all of which are invisible to the human eye and inaudible to the human ear, but can be clearly known by means of extrasensory perceptions like divine sight and divine hearing. Being rather audacious by nature, I couldn't resist asking a John Mon about his experiences with the Deva's worlds. I knew full well he'd give me a tongue lashing, but I decided I had to ask him regardless of the consequences. 
One night while I massaged his limbs, I summoned enough courage to pose my question, though I remained apprehensive about his response. But before I spoke up, as I considered how to phrase my question, Ajahn Man called out my name. Gia, if you've got a question to ask, ask it. You're so confused you can't think straight. Despite the intense fear I felt at that moment, I blurted out, What do celestial beings look like? What do they sound like? How can I see them too? Duly provoked, Ajahn Man replied, That's none of your business. You're always asking such trivial questions. Forget about the devas and their appearance. Your problems exist right there inside your own heart and mind, and the devas have nothing to do with that. Look at your own appearance. Use some wisdom to examine the hair, nails, teeth, and skin that form the outer shell of your body. See them clearly for what they really are. The Buddha examined and investigated himself until he attained supreme enlightenment before he turned his attention to teaching humans and celestial beings. But you've become infatuated with the visible trappings of the world around you, even though you're still too blind to know what you're seeing. Be careful you don't damage your eyes before you even open them. Right then and there I bowed to Ajahn Man's superior wisdom. He continued by exhorting me to focus all my attention on my meditation practice. Only then would the whole panorama of the Dhamma's possibilities open up before me. After that, anything would be possible. As if to illustrate those possibilities, he related the story of a monk he befriended while living deep within the northern wilderness. A monk whose extrasensory powers were so acute that he could make himself small enough to pass through the eye of a keyhole. When he wished, he could vanish into thin air. He could travel through space like a bird. He could dive into the earth as if it were water and walk on water as if it were land. He could pass through walls and mountains as if they weren't there. The virtues of his character and the power of his concentration were so great that he had mastered the ability to manipulate the four elements. However, he lived and died alone in the wilderness without ever exhibiting those supernatural powers publicly. Noticing my eyes light up with amazement as he spoke, Ajahn Man quickly reminded me not to join the legions of blind people who waste their lives seeking delight in things they don't know and can't see. Instead, he urged me to focus full attention on my potential as a human being. He stressed that, of all forms of existence, a human birth is especially opportune because it offers the best chance to overcome suffering and its causes. Shortly after I asked the question about celestial beings, Ajahn Mond assembled the whole community for a Dhamma talk, in which he urged the monks under his care to be more diligent in their training. Why is it that other meditators can develop calm and concentration, but you can't? Your bodies and minds are basically no different from theirs. Only the attitude and the effort are different. You must understand that no matter how immense the goal may appear, it is possible to achieve it provided you are willing to make the necessary effort. Reflect for a moment on the importance of a human birth. Of all possible births, a human birth is the one in which success on the Buddha's path is truly possible, precisely because we have the capacity to gain insights into the pain and difficulty of human existence and use those insights to overcome the fundamental causes of suffering. So, learn to endure hardship and use that experience as a motivation to realize the truth. Don't let this opportunity slip through your grasp. The devas that come to see me enjoy lives of ease and comfort, never having reason to long for freedom from suffering. They tend to indulge in their own complacency. We human beings don't have that luxury. Human life is not a time for complacency. Where is your sense of urgency, your enthusiasm for the challenge? Wasting the incredible opportunity for liberation this human life gives you will bring you face to face with the Lord of Death and the gates of Hell. Don't say I didn't warn you. 
In the training, fear and dread of the consequences of weakness and backsliding in meditation practice are attitudes that can arouse enthusiasm and resolve. Once these attitudes are awakened, they must be diligently upheld. Even when guided by the best of intentions, the life of a human being is full of pain and uncertainty. If old mental habits are allowed to remain stubbornly entrenched, they can produce unintended consequences when your initial enthusiasm and resolve eventually lose momentum. For the same reason, it is possible to undertake the practice of Dhamma with intense energy and commitment only to later turn away with little to show for your intention to attain freedom from suffering. Under those circumstances, death carries the possibility of future suffering and infernal torment. If you squander this incredible opportunity for liberation, how will you feel when the Lord of Death makes his ghastly appearance? How will you feel when hell's minions throw you scraps like they would a scrawny stray dog? See the danger clearly and gather your courage to stand firm in the struggle. Whatever ground you have gained in your battle with the defiling forces inside the mind must be held without yielding an inch. Your commitment and enthusiasm for the Dhamma must be safeguarded and never be allowed to retreat. A shiver raced through my heart as I sat listening to Ajahn Mand's powerful Dhamma. Ajahn Mand used his very acute powers of extrasensory perception to ensure against his students thinking or acting carelessly and without restraint. He chastised many heedless monks who were unaware he was privy to their thoughts and actions. Tan Pan was one such case. Tan Pan had previously been a well-known boxer in the Swan Gulap boxing camp. Giving up his profession to ordain as a monk, he followed Ajahn Gong Ma from his home in Ubon Rachatani province to Chantaburi, where he began his monastic training at Saingam Forest Monastery. Under Ajahn Gong Ma's guidance, he developed a strong faith in forest meditation practices. Aware of Ajahn Mand's excellent reputation as a revered meditation master, he eventually traveled to the north in search of the place where he resided. Inadvertently, he'd left some photographs of boxers posing in various stances in his shoulder bag. Carrying these photos, he traveled from Bangkok to Chiang Mai, searching for Ajahn Mand in the mountainous region where he lived. Finally arriving at Deng Forest Monastery, he paid his respects to Ajahn Mond and explained his reasons for coming. Ajahn Mond accepted him as a disciple and gave him dependence. Ajahn Mond must have investigated the new monk that night. The next morning, when all the monks gathered in preparation for alms round, he straightaway addressed the new arrival. You claimed you came here for the purpose of learning about Dhamma. Why then did you exhibit such dreadful behavior last night? As I sat in meditation, you appeared right in front of me and started shadow boxing, punching, and kicking the air around me like a prize fighter. Luckily, you didn't hurt me. Such behavior is not normal for someone with good intentions. What's the matter with you? Speak up. Tan Pan stood frozen to the spot, his heart racing and his body shaking with fear. His mouth opened, but he couldn't utter a word. He offered no response to a John Mond's inquiries. A monk who had befriended him then spoke up in his defense, telling Ajahn Mond that Tan Pan had been a professional boxer. Having become disillusioned with life in the ring, he decided to ordain and devote his energy to a more noble pursuit. A John Mond noticed that Tan Pan looked unwell, so he changed the subject, saying it was time to go on alms round. Later, he told the other monk to question him privately, since Tan Pan's fear of Ajahn Mond prevented him from speaking coherently. After the meal, the monk found an opportunity to question him in private. During their discussion, the two monks searched for a solution to this dilemma. Looking inside Tan Pan's shoulder bag, they discovered the photographs of boxers facing the camera with fists raised as if ready to strike. They immediately realized the implications— Ajahn Mond's fine-tuned extrasensory perception had picked up on these images. After looking at them, they were convinced that the pictures were the cause of Ajahn Mond's interrogation. 
Regretting his carelessness, Tan Pan decided to burn the offending images. But after that, life with Ajahn Mun returned to normal, and the boxing issue never resurfaced. During the time Ajahn Mun spent recuperating from malaria at Poor Forest, one of his more senior disciples, Ajahn Un Kalyana Damo, accompanied by a group of high-ranking lay people, came to talk to him about the virtues of eating vegetarian food. In their attempt to educate Ajahn Mun on the subject, they extolled the benefits of eating vegetarian meals, implying by their praise of a meatless diet that wise and discerning people prefer to be vegetarian. Their claim that vegetarians are clean and pure, whereas meat-eaters are like demons and ghosts performing evil deeds, struck a raw nerve with Ajahn Mun. As I sat there listening, I surmised that it wouldn't be long before Ajahn Mun rebuked them. When they paused their harangue for a moment, Ajahn Mun issued a scathing retort. Well, Un, is this what you want to talk about? Listen here. People don't become virtuous because of the type of food they eat, but rather because of how well they reflect on the real purpose of eating food, whether it be vegetables or meat. Unlike the mind, neither meat nor vegetables can differentiate between what is good and what is bad, between wholesome and unwholesome qualities. Only the Buddha's teachings in all their aspects are capable of cleansing and purifying the mind. Only the Dhamma can teach us how to root out the bad and cultivate the good, to abandon the unwholesome and promote the wholesome. Do you understand what I'm saying? Have any of you tried to realize the supreme Dhamma? Do you think merely chewing on vegetables will enlighten your mind? What power does food have anyway? It goes in fresh at one end and comes out a pile of excrement at the other. And from that, you derive purity of mind? Since when has filth become virtuous? Meanwhile, the mind is full of its own form of excrement, the excretions of greed, ill will, and delusion. Everyone's mind is polluted by these defiling excretions. Why don't you put concerns for your stomachs aside and look at what really matters? The Buddha, teacher of humans and dewas, was preeminent in wisdom. And the Vinaya rules state clearly that monks are allowed to eat meat. Yet you seem to think your wisdom surpasses that of the Buddha, that you can do him one better. As monks, we eat whatever food has been offered to us by lay supporters. Whether the food is fine or coarse, appetizing or unappealing, we accept it with gratitude and eat it for the health and well-being of the body. The Buddha laid down several rules forbidding monks from asking for the food they preferred to eat. They were expected to eat just the kind of meals that ordinary people ate, which often contained meat. In your rush to judgment, you seem to have forgotten that Devadatta tried to claim the same exception you have. When trying to create a schism in the Sangha, he challenged the Buddha to declare that all his monks must be vegetarians. As you surely know, the Buddha refused and cited the Vinaya rule that monks may eat fish or meat if it is not from an animal whose meat is specifically forbidden, and as long as they had no reason to believe that the animal was slaughtered specifically for them. If it's true that eating vegetation leads to enlightenment, then cows and water buffaloes are bound to attain enlightenment before any of us, because they have eaten nothing but grass since the day they were born. Their mouths and stomachs are full of greens from morning till evening, and yet they can't stop chasing each other around, fornicating all over the grasslands. Where's the virtue in that? I'm not criticizing you for not eating meat. That's your choice to make. I don't take issue with that. But I do take issue with you for disparaging others who eat meat, suggesting they are demons and ghosts while praising yourselves as being superior to them because of your vegetarian diet. That thinking is arrogant and inappropriate. Search within your own minds first to find out if anything truly virtuous resides there. Realize that you have yet to attain a superior level of virtue and get to work ridding your minds of the sensual desire, aversion, and delusion that are blocking your path to freedom. 
Don't waste time and energy traveling around trying to convince people that they should become vegetarians. We human beings achieve goodness and virtue through the purity of our intentions and the quality of our behavior, not through our stomachs and what we put in them. The kind of food we eat is a minor issue. Stop exaggerating its importance. Whatever keeps us alive from one day to the next is fit for our needs. If you prefer to eat only vegetarian food, feel free to do so. But don't seek to drag others along with you. I, for one, am firmly established in Dhamma principles. After Ajahn Mond finished speaking, Ajahn Oon and his lay supporters remained totally silent. They shot each other sideways glances, but no one dared contradict Ajahn Mond. They probably felt as though a bolt of lightning had struck them from a clear blue sky. Some, no doubt, understood the reasoning behind Ajahn Mond's retort. Others, to their misfortune, refused to accept the truth of what they heard. 